Hi, and welcome to the weekly market update from Morton Brown Family Wealth for the week of April 5th, 2021. I'm Dennis Morton here with Katie Brown and Cody Demmel. How are you guys? Hey, Dennis. Great. Good. Good morning. All right. So we're going to start out the second quarter of this year talking about the booming manufacturing sector, which is something we've been hoping would come back. Cody, we got some numbers this week on what, what's happening in manufacturing, and it's pretty encouraging. What'd you say? Yeah, so it's great to see um, manufacturing starting back up in the U.S. So we just got the reading for March, um, and it was 64, which is the highest level we've had in over 37 years. And over 50 on the index indicates expansion. So we're pretty well above the expansion level. So, I mean, that that's great to see. Yeah, looking back, even 12 months ago or 15 months ago when the economy was going at a pretty brisk pace, we were only in the 50s. Those numbers were much lower. So that, that's a big expansion. What does that tell you, Katie, about what, what's happening out there? Yeah, that definitely, you know, indicates that there's a lot of demand out there. That manufacturing sector accounts for almost 12% of the U.S. economy. And so to see the, that large jump in, in that kind of indication of expansion, that, that kind of fits right in with part of the hope with a lot of the stimulus and, you know, the pent up savings and, and everything else that, that it would drive that manufacturing and drive that, that demand. Yeah, you think there's the demand is coming back and that savings is being spent. I looked back on the personal savings rate, which we've talked about a little bit before, how when the, st when the first stimulus came out last May, you saw this spike up from the historical average of about 7% up to almost 20%. So people, you know, the cash kind of came in and then was spent down. We saw another influx jump up to 20% in January with the second stimulus, and that money was spent down in the first quarter. So all that demand kind of coming back where it can in the economy, I think is, is really uh, driving things up but some interesting places where demand is feeling pinched you know the auto sector they can't find chips there was a, a comment we read this week about how you know the chip sector is the new transportation sector because you can't build a vehicle unless it has the embedded technology no chips no cars and, and it's along with some of the gdp estimates that we have for this year too i mean we'll get that number later this month but Hopefully it'll be around 10% for this quarter. And they're still estimating around a 7% GDP growth for this year, which is great. I mean, realizing that we we came off down over 3% last year, but it's so great to see early in 2021. And Katie, you mentioned the percentage of the domestic economy, even more so in Europe, right? Like when we talk about if you're invested internationally, uh, specifically in Europe, Europe has a much higher exposure to things like manufacturing and materials and financials, which all did really well in the first quarter of this year. So, and Europe has one third of the exposure to the tech economy. So tech has been lagging behind, floundering a little bit, um, where you're seeing these other sectors really ramping up. So it's good for investors if you're, if you're globally diversified, you're benefiting from this manufacturing boom that's happening. Yeah, yeah, we are continuing to see that that shift of growth being the leader to value now. We're beyond that kind of fluke phase where we had little spikes in value. I mean, we're starting to get more of a, a, a drawn out run here where value is leading. And, you know, much of the uh, international markets are value based. Yes. A lot of banking, a lot of energy, a lot of said, manufacturing. And so not, not surprising that international markets are had a pretty strong first quarter. All right. So another piece of news this morning, Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan, came out with his annual letter. The highlight of that was a very optimistic outlook for the economy, at least for the next several years. And he thinks some of these valuations of stocks, while high, might be justified based on a lot of different factors. Katie, I think you counted seven different factors that were going to be that, that he counted. Say any one of these or two of these would be great. Do you remember the seven that, that he highlighted here? Yes, I'm going to I'm going to bring this up. So I apologize. He's working away. His quote, I have little doubt that with excess savings, new stimulus savings, new deficit spending, more QE, a new potential infrastructure bill, a successful vaccine, and euphoria around the end of the pandemic, the U.S. economy will likely boom. So it's not one, two, three different things coming at us. It's, you know, seven, seven really great arguments for a, a strong economy over the next year plus, potentially. I mean, he was... You're pretty confident in saying this is probably going to bleed over into 2023. Right. So it kind of makes you take that your, your book on historical valuations of stocks and there it goes. You know, these factors coming together is a really unique situation. But Cody, he also highlighted some risks. Like what are the risks of this particular moment and, and the challenges there? 
Yeah. Um, so some of the risk he brought up in the U.S., obviously, we, we are close to all-time high valuations. And then obviously, unfortunately, the, some of the social distress we've had and political risks. But he also compared it to some of the other recessions coming out of it, with the Great Depression. And in the 60s and 70s, he noted how the U.S. was in a much better spot coming out of those compared to currently. And I guess one of his concerns is just the international competitors now are in a better spot to where they were in the, the past recessions. Right. It's that relative, I mean, the U.S. is strong, but relative to others, are we as strong comparatively? And there are some, some questions there. And I think the way he put it was the impact of all of those things, especially when it comes down to stimulus and spending, we won't know the impact of these for years. And it really depends on the quality of that spending. Was it directed to the right things? Like the quantity is one thing, the quality is another. Uh, and that, that remains to be seen. That will also let us know how effective the stimulus package is too, right. with right. the quality of the spending on, on the infrastructure and, and how much that does support the economy. Right. And I think that's that's still the lesson that came out of the great financial crisis is there was a there was an infusion of stimulus and it wasn't maybe as targeted as it, as it could or what it should have been. And I think there's, there's still lessons being applied to that, rightly or wrongly. And, and the truth is, we're going to have successes and make mistakes in this process too. We just don't know where they are and it will remain to be remain to be seen. One other story that popped up recently, it's a little bit wonky, but I think worth touching on, which is the blow up of the family office of Archegos, uh, which has really introduced systemic risk like we haven't seen in a little while, really affecting some big banks. Katie, give us kind of a high level of this story about how a family office built up then blew up. Yeah, so this particular family office, you know, there are a handful of stocks that they took very large leverage positions in. So they built these huge positions through like swaps using leverage from banks, using capital from banks. And and positions like that don't necessarily have to be reported. So so they're growing, you know, these huge stock positions and and when those fall, which happened in this case for Archegos and Archegos then became insolvent. And, and so now the banks are left, they have lend, lended out all that money that they're not getting back. And it's a huge impact, especially on Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse, there's been a lot of headlines with you know the massive amount of debt now that's not going to be repaid. What is it, $4.7 billion? Some of this comes down to the different regulations that exist in different countries. And I mean, this is all happening under the surface. This is a lightly regulated aspect of the economy. Bill Wang, the Archegos Capital founder, few people knew who he was, but he amassed a substantial fortune very quietly uh, building these relationships. And I think he, there were like nine companies where he was one of the largest holders of the company, Viacom being one of them. It was just all these huge Sorry. bets. Yeah, all these huge bets that he was making. And it really came down to the banks to see who was managing risk best. And Cody, some banks managed to get out, didn't they? Yeah, there was uh, some news this morning that some of the banks, um, especially the U.S. banks who have more regulation, I guess got, got pretty lucky and got out literally the day before all this happened. Morgan Stanley, in particular, got out the day before this blow up happened, where they needed to raise $20 billion to cover the losses that they had on in some of those leveraged positions. I think the thing that was really highlighted is is that difference in you know the U.S. coming out of the financial crisis. We we saw the U.S. banks you know restructuring a lot of their policies, their procedures, more regulation, a, a deeper due diligence that that's required for for them to provide the lending um, in situations like this. Versus international banks like European banks don't have that same level of regulation on them. And so they can take on some riskier assets. And, and this highlights the risk in doing that. This, this could create some ripple effects and some highlight some systemic issues requiring a greater level restructuring for a lot of international banks. I think the takeaway for, for our community is, is this. It was a great quote on the Odd Lots podcast from Bloomberg last week where they talk about by the time we're learning how something works in finance, that's probably bad news. Because when something's going up, when, it, when a guy's investing and in building up a $10 billion firm or whatever Archegos Capital ended up being at its peak, no, nobody asks too many questions, usually. You know, we're making money, it's fine. It's when it blows up that everybody says, hey, wait a minute, how did all this happen? So uh, again, it speaks to 
if the performance looks too good to be true, it may, it may be that case. I mean, if we look back to CDOs uh, during the great financial crisis, non-traded real estate, all, all these other things where usually we don't discover what's wrong with it until it blows up. And that's where it's important to have that due diligence, know what you own, why you own it. Um, this is just a, another example of that. And, and Credit Suisse, you know, we saw a lot of their executive positions, their, their chief risk officer, a lot of those top level positions, they, they weren't doing their job. Right. All right. So um, we we're talking this morning a little bit about just uh, you know, ebbs and flows in the economy. We talk about manufacturing. Travel is another one. So, um, Cody, you encountered an interesting travel situation, just an anecdote of how things are, are resuming normal in fits and starts, right? Yeah. Um, so we're going to Florida in early May and we booked our original flight back in February through United. It got canceled. They said they couldn't help us <laughs> rebook. So then we went with American. They just canceled. So we went back to United and they have the same flights that we originally booked, but off by like three or five minutes. And it's, I don't know, 20, 25% more. And it's already like completely booked. So it's yeah. just <laughs> crazy. We, we have a, a flight um, out West that we had scheduled back in early January for late June. And we're, we're a larger family. So we need something that seats more than five. And for the last three months, we've been trying to find a rental vehicle. I think it was, um, you know, Hertz Dollar and Thrifty are all part of one organization. They said, there are no vehicles right now. If you're looking, that is one of those areas where if you're looking for a larger vehicle, we can't get them from the manufacturer. We don't know when they're going to get them. The best you can do is check back with us every three weeks and try and find it. And this is a national issue. It's not just where you're going. So um, if you're looking for a sedan or a compact SUV, great. But larger vehicles, no, no such luck. So it, it's kind of a... And it just, that's where the manufacturing kind of trickles down to different facets of the economy. So Katie, any troubles booking anything recently? No, but you guys have me nervous. <laughs> yeah. We have some flights and, and cars actually on, on the calendar, hoping to sneak away down to Florida also on Memorial Day. In our first video of Q3, we're going to report back on all of our travel uh, adventures. and let you know what, what, what happened and what didn't. And, and Cody will be stuck in Florida. So. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining us today. Let us know if there's a topic you'd like to hear about in the future. And hope you have a great rest of the week. We'll talk to you soon.